thought I'd split it up and answer probably some of the harder questions in there. Uh, but Before we head there today, I want to read a couple of scriptures. Uh, the first one comes from John, um, John 18, and the other one is our reading for today from Genesis. So John 18, verses uh, 33 through to 38. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? In Genesis 3 verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to be desired to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. What do you think is the most pressing question in the world today? Come on, simple, simple. I've given you the answer already. What is truth? It vexes us, doesn't it? You see, we've lived um, over the past few centuries in, in different kinds of decades. You would have heard we've, we've lived in um, enlightenment, we've lived in modernity, we've lived in post-modernity, and everybody's going... What the heck is post-modernity? And some people are saying we're post-post-modernity now. Essentially, though, you know, I don't do lots of studies in this particular area, but post-modernity has gone, we can't always trust science. They finally figured that out. We can't always trust science. So what can we trust? Where can we find our truth? You know, well, if we can't trust science, then the only truth I can really be sure of is the way I feel. Is that right? That's the one truth that I can be sure of, is the way I feel. I can feel happy, I can feel sad, I can feel all kinds of things, and this is my truth. And therefore, if you say something that I find offensive, you have offended me because I feel offended. Have you come across this recently? Yes. So, Because of the way I feel now, I blame others for the way I feel, which actually isn't correct, is it? Because who has responsibility for the way they feel? We do. How often do we practice that? It's a good thing knowing that we're in control, supposedly, but actually how often do we practice that when someone upsets me and I go, upset me, and I blame them for it. 
I'm actually not taking responsibility for my feeling, am I? So my truth is that they've offended me, they've upset me, they need to do something to set it right. When actually the responsibility lies with me. Because if someone offends, or if I get offended by someone and it puts me out of relationship with them, what has God told me to do about it? To go and talk with them and to forgive them. Is this right? And who has to start that? I have to start that. But where do we find truth? Where do we find that truth in a world that says the truth is my feelings and therefore anything I feel is the truth and if you don't feel the same way then you're wrong and I'm right. Or you can have your truth and my truth and we just have to learn to live together. Where do we find the truth in this world? In the book? Do we have any more takers? Going once? Going twice in the book? What if I was to say I didn't agree with you? Oh no. We've called a heretic. Doesn't alter what you know. What if I say to you, Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am the life. Fair call? Okay, so... The truth isn't a what, the truth is a who. Right? But you're right. We find out about Jesus, don't we? We read about Jesus. We understand Jesus in a relationship with Jesus through God's word that is inspired by God's spirit to speak into our lives. So when we head into Genesis 3, chapters 1 to 7. Remember, I've asked you, what does it mean to be human? But one of the questions that pops out of Genesis 3, 1 to 7 is, what is truth? Because what's the f- one of the first things that the serpent says to Eve? Did God... Did God say that you shall not eat of any fruit of the tree in the garden? Or did God say that? No, he didn't. God actually said, if you read back in chapter 2, you can eat of any tree in the garden except for the one. Was the serpent lying, though? He's not lying, but he caused Eve to rethink through a different framework what God had said. And so she had to consider what God said and then think, oh, but the the, the serpent did it in a negative sense, didn't he? Whereas God's was positive, the serpent's was negative. But what did it cause Eve to do? It caused her to look. It caused her to look, didn't it? And the other thing is that what Eve said is that we can eat of any tree except for the, the, the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden and we shall not touch it lest we die. But actually, God said nothing about touching it. Do you realize that? But God said you didn't have to touch it, you weren't to eat of it. So how close could you get to the fruit before you would surely die? You could almost put it in your mouth, couldn't you? You could pick it. You just can't eat it. Now, the devil plays on this, you see. The devil plays on this, and you're not going to die, the devil says. In fact, God knows that when you eat of it, you're going to become like him. So he adds to the story that God has given. But has he lied? Has he told the truth? Sorry? Well, where did he lie?
Oh, yes, but, but did the devil lie? But becoming like God doesn't mean becoming God. And we are made in his likeness, aren't we? But we're not God. Someone asked me this question recently. Did the devil, did the devil, did the serpent lie? And I'm going, well, it depends your definition of lie, doesn't it? If, if lie is telling an untruth, then he didn't say an untruth at all. But if he manipulated truth, is that still lying? You could say Gene is just semantics. But he actually manipulated. It's very subtle. It caused Eve to doubt God's words. Right? Now, what does it mean to be human in this scenario is that we can hear other voices and not only God's. Even these two people who we kind of think were perfect, created awesomely in the garden by God, could hear other voices. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. I want to do that with Jesus one day. Um, um, you've got these other voices in our heads all the time testing us all the time asking us questions of what we believe do you find that or is it just me we've got other things wanting to take our focus off the real message of god and to get our focus onto something else to distract us from what god wants for us how do we respond to those voices I'm one of the best people, I reckon, who can, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I could twist almost anything to say that something that is bad is actually good. You ever come across people like that? You see, part of me, I, 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 I used to enjoy more and more, like less now because it gets me into trouble, playing devil's advocate. And so when you learn to play devil's advocate, you learn how to twist things. And it's actually, that's what the serpent was doing, playing devil's advocate with Eve. But it caused Eve to take some action. So being human says we hear other voices, not just God's. We have to discern where those voices come from. And then we have to act on what we believe to be the truth. human says we've got free will we have choice we can choose being human also means that we desire see desire goes beyond just mentality doesn't it just academia kind of stuff it goes beyond just knowing something it goes deeper into the seat of our being when we see something that we desire what does it mean for us sorry we want it, but why do we want it? What's it done to us to make us want it? Right, there's a craving in there, doesn't it? The desire is a craving. Are all cravings selfish? Ask my wife during her first pregnancy how much salt she wanted to eat. Not all cravings are selfish. Does anybody in here want to crave the word of God more? So craving's okay, isn't it? But what is the focus of our craving? What was the focus of Eve's craving? The fruit on the tree. See, we read here that she looked at it. Oh, I need my glasses. No, it's all right, they're in my pocket. I bought my small print Bible. I should have known better. I understand it comes with old age. Um, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. True? Yep. I don't know about you. If I walk down a, a, a street somewhere and there's a, 
a plum tree or a peach tree hanging over a fence and I look at it and it's full of fruit, what do I do? I pick one because it looks good to eat, doesn't it? So sure it was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes. Yes, it was good looking fruit. Mm -hmm. And it was to be desired to make one wise or to give insight. So that desire was that desire to become like God, knowing good from evil. And it stirred that desire in her. See, being human, have you noticed the longer you look at something, the longer you want it, the more you want it? You set your eyes on something. I'm, I'm really bad with it. Um, I used to be actually really bad with it. Um, I'd see some of the latest technology come out. So I like technology. And you know, that's all. Those new flip phones look pretty good, don't they? Or the new folds. I wonder how they work. And the more time I actually spend looking into it and reading about it, the more I want one. I'm not too sure why I want one, but my desire says I just, I just want the next best thing, I think. The thing that I think will help me more. When in fact, it probably doesn't help me that much. At the end of the day, it's just a glorified phone. Isn't it? It actually takes me away from people more than it gets me towards people. It does have great cameras, though. <laughs> but everything we desire is not always good. But being human says that actually we do desire as humans, and desiring is not a bad thing. The focus of what we desire becomes the important thing. And Eve's focus became being more like God. And so she eats of the fruit. She picks it, she eats it, and she gives it to hubby who's standing there. Stupid idiot. I wonder what would have happened if he hadn't eaten the fruit. Hey? It <laughs> would have been great. <laughs> No more weeds. No, that's right. Well, yeah, it, it, we can only imagine, can't we? Yeah. But let's not think that, that, that Eve is the bad, the bad person here, alone. Adam is too. Adam is too. So, you know, it's, it, when, we, when we come to talk about uh, equality between the sexes, and some of us will read, you know, later on how Paul talks about how bad Eve is and how terrible Eve is. He's doing that for a purpose within a given context. He's not saying that men weren't or that women are any worse than men. Paul will also write there's no male or female, doesn't he? He did. He did which is perhaps why Eve didn't, some would say why Eve didn't quite get it right. You know, Adam, Adam might have said to her, look, honey, um, see that tree there? We're not allowed to eat the fruit of that, so to make sure you don't eat the fruit of it, don't even touch it, because you'll die. You know, that's what God said, so just don't touch it. But some would argue, well, you should never add to God's word, should you? <laughs> Oh, well, that's, that's a really good question because, because that's the next thing and here's one of the big questions is what was death? They would have no idea of dying. None whatsoever. And the other question is did die mean immediately die? Right? Because the serpent said to Eve, you'll surely not die. And they ate of the fruit and did they die? Sorry? Uh, was it physical or spiritual deal or relational death? So this gets us into some really interesting questions, doesn't it? Because Adam and Eve were in relationship with God in the garden. Were Adam and Eve still in relationship with God outside of the garden? Yes, they were. Absolutely. After they had sinned, God still spoke with them. They still spoke with God. 
uh, the relationship from humans toward God changed, yes. Because it was our first genetically modified fruit, wasn't it? Sorry, I'm just kidding, okay. Some of our translations will say that when they ate of the fruit, they would be doomed to die. Right? And later on, God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden in case they ate of the tree of life. So commentators are all a bit kind of, no one seems to come to any conclusion, firm conclusion about um, whether they were meant to die immediately or not. But the broad consensus is that they did die. Eventually, they were going to die. And whilst they were in the garden, they could eat of the tree of life and continue to live. Um, so a couple of the commentators say, we often think that if they ate of the tree of life, then they automatically got eternal life or immortal life. Most of them don't actually believe that. They believe that as they continue to eat of the fruit from the tree of life, they just continue to live longer and longer and longer. And so that what happened when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God found out about it, he had to kick them out of the garden in case they continued to eat of the tree of life and live forever. So in a sense then, logically and rationally, they died. They would die. Death was inevitable for them. So God didn't tell a lie. The devil did it. Oh, it's not the devil actually, it's the serpent. I keep on saying the devil because that's been my thinking for so many years. The serpent didn't lie either in the fact that they wouldn't die immediately. But the serpent told an untruth in the fact that they would end up dying, but it depended on what consequence God put in place for their sin. See, God was the one who would actually end up deciding what was going to happen to Adam and Eve should they eat of the fruit of the tree of good and knowledge, knowledge of good and evil. So being human actually means that when we make decisions based on whatever reasons we base them on, there will be consequences, good or bad. Shivana. Well, that's why God put them out. So, so Giovanna asked, what happens if they took of one and of the other? Um, as long as they were in the garden and could continue to eat from the tree of life, they would continue to live. Because as long as they stopped eating from the tree of life, they would die. They, so that's why God had to put them out of the garden. That was the consequence. God said, you will surely die. And what happens once you kick them out of the garden? They surely died. They surely died. Because God then set up all kinds of things around the garden of Eden that they would never get back in there again. Didn't he? So eventually they would surely die. So to be human means we die. We should not be surprised by this fact. Okay? And I guess in different times and different families I've come across in doing f funerals, I, I continue to find it surprising I guess that death comes as a shock to people. Maybe it's just me. But actually as believers, as humans, we all know we're going to die. There's no magic formula to keep us living longer on this earth. The other thing about being human is that our relationship with God has changed, I believe, from when it was in the garden. Because, not because of God, but because of humanity. You see, they start out, the writer starts out in Genesis 3 saying that the snake is the shrewdest, the most cunning of all of God's creatures. 
Did anybody think of anywhere in the New Testament where the word shrewd is used? The shrewd manager. Yeah, the shrewd manager. So shrewd is not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Is it shrewd to save money for retirement? It's wise or should well that yep, yep, it's wise, it's shrewd. How many other things in life are shrewd to do? Why do we always put a negative connotation on the word shrewd? I reckon Scottish people were shrewd. Hey? Good Presbyterians. So shrewd isn't necessarily a bad thing. But it, it, it shows that there's an understanding of the world. There's an understanding of how things work. And to be able to be shrewd is to use something to the best of its ability for your purposes, mostly. But it could be for an organization's purposes. I mean, we have decision makers within the church, don't we, that are making decisions and we hope they're going to make shrewd decisions. Good decisions, wise decisions, wise decisions. Now, the reason why I think this is important, and again, because it comes back to this whole thing about they recognized they were naked. Was it nakedness that made them feel ashamed? Or what was it about nakedness that made them feel ashamed? They were vulnerable. Now, why were they vulnerable? Do try and hide from God, yes, yes, um, but they're being ashamed because they were naked. If being shrewd or being wise means that you had a certain amount of knowledge to make the right decisions, Adam and Eve actually lacked that initially. Right, could the serpent speak human or could Adam and Eve speak snake? The first case of tongues, you reckon? I don't have an answer for you, darling, because the Bible doesn't tell us. Okay, I love the way your mind thinks, though. Yeah. So commentators would say actually their ashamedness didn't necessarily have anything to do with the nakedness, but the nakedness was part of what happened. Adam and Eve, the commentators would say, were naive to begin with. They had shame is a really good word. Is it the lie? I just want to, so is shame the lie, is the question asked. I just want to come back and, I'm going to make a statement, you don't have, and obviously you don't have to agree with this. The serpent didn't make them do anything. <laughs> Again, you know, the serpent didn't make them do anything. They chose out of their feeling. They put the truth aside for what they felt was the right thing to do. Um, but they became ashamed because all of a sudden their world was opened up and they weren't naive anymore. And so when people have said to me, oh, why were they ashamed they were naked? And I said, because I actually reckon that all of a sudden they could see how nakedness could be used. 
the repercussions of nakedness, of what had then stirred within them, of what that then meant. They, they became, for want of a word, open to what could be done now, to what it would mean. And, you know, we, we all know, don't we, that one of the biggest money-making things in the world these days is pornography. It actually funds funds more than we would real that you realise it funds, actually, in terms of technology, especially. So it's not so much that they were naked, but what they could then foresee around their nakedness. Does that make sense? But this would be one of the first things that they noticed. <laughs> we have to realise this. This will be one of the first things that they noticed about one another was that they were naked. And then they understood all the things around what that would mean for them in terms of desire and all the stuff that comes with that. And so all of a sudden, we've got Adam and Eve in this realm and this world that they begin to look and they're, they're overwhelmed now with desire. Does that make sense? Have you ever been in a space where you're overwhelmed with desire? And you just go, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be looking this, I shouldn't be doing this, and all you want to do is hide. And that's exactly what they did. So they sowed fig leaves, fig leaves together to cover themselves up. Which is another thing that is about being human as we try to cover up our sin. Does anybody here try to cover up their sin? Oop, I've done something wrong. In fact, if you read later on, how did Adam try to cover up his sin after the fig leaves? It's her fault. It's this, it's this woman you gave me. But we try to actually cover up our sin because of the shame it brings on us. And again, what is God's antidote to that? God's antidote is confession. God's antidote is actually confess your sin one to another. How often do we do that? Oh, because bring them business. When they don't anything. Maybe it's one thing the Catholics got right. Just a thought. And James, if you're sick, what do you do? You call the elders around to anoint you with oil and you confess your sins because the prayer of a righteous person avails much. He does. That's, um, I wholeheartedly agree with you. That's the ideal, that is the theory. <laughs> um, do anybody, anybody here find it difficult to let go of shame of things they've done or to let go of regret? I actually think it's a bit of a process, um, which gets us into the realm of forgiveness, and we don't have much time for that today. Um, no, I won't get into that now. Often people will say you have to forgive yourself and I say, where, show me in the Bible where it says you have to forgive yourself. It doesn't. It's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to forgive yourself. You either sin against God or you sin against others. And if you sin against God, you need his forgiveness. And if you sin against others, you need their forgiveness. Interesting. How do you know that you're forgiven unless you hear it from somebody that you're forgiven? How do you know that you're forgiven from God, actually, if you're not sitting down and confessing with someone and asking forgiveness and them actually be able to declare over you, God has forgiven you in Jesus Christ? We need to hear this. This is part of the body of Christ. This is why I love the body of Christ. Actually, we're meant to have these relationships with one another where we 
are impacted by God's love and grace and mercy in this space and our gatherings together wherever they are. But unfortunately, the church has become a place where most people feel judgment, even those within it. We have to come against that. Anyway, another sermon. So being human means we hear lots of different voices attracting us. It means we have choices to make. Um, we have desires that will want to lead our decision-making processes that might lead us away from the truth. Um, it means that when we do stuff up, when we do sin, that quite often we'll want to cover it up and not let it out into the light, but we'll want to bury it deep. That's often one of the first responses we have to it now. We want to push God further away. And it also says then that our relationship with God is broken. His love for us remains, but we were not faithful to him. Adam and Eve weren't, and therefore we are in that consequence. We have to choose now to be faithful to God. But let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you're human. No, not you, that we're human. Thank you, Lord, that we're human. And that when you sent Jesus, you continue to show your everlasting faithfulness to us. Your, your love towards us is never ending. I just want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you that no matter what our lives have been like, whether we think we're good enough or not, that you love us as we are. And in Jesus, you have reached out to us like uh, a captain on a boat reaching out to someone who's fallen over the side and brings them up into the boat where people can love and help and bring new life. Help us to be those people on the boat with you, Lord Jesus reaching out to others that need to know that they are loved. I ask this in your name, Jesus.